again, Karen Carter. <laughs> and then I asked the same question to Deirdre. And Deirdre said, you know, it's important to smile. It's important to be happy. I want to move through the world. She says, I smile 465 days. Now, how many days in the year? She said, <laughs> first when I heard it, I said, wait a minute. She said, 465. I said, I don't think that, I think that's a little bit over what you normally get in a year. She said, no, I smile 465 days of the year. You should be happy. You should be smiling. When I see people, I want to, want to, know, I want to know why they're not smiling. And then she had a very, very serious illness. And after the illness, she didn't feel like smiling. And she said what came out of the experience was for her to understand, yes, you can smile. Because I'm sure, see, she's smiling right now. <laughs> but sometimes you have to be still and be where you are. And a smile not necessarily come on, comes on your face because you're processing it. So that was the gift. So again, I want to introduce you to Deirdre Jr. Now again, we're going to turn the conversation. It says, what's in your package knowing your worth and negotiating for it? We want to step into this space around negotiating your package and understanding your worth and negotiating for it but we want to start with your core. Because we could be quite prescriptive. We can say when you're negotiating, you need to work this, you need to work that, you need to think about this, you need to prep this way, you need to consider this. We could go through all of it, and some of it we will, but that's not where we want to start. We want to start with your core. We want to start with what you feel you deserve and, you are, and, and how does that show up in the negotiation process. So my first question to both of you is this. Knowing your worth, how does one clearly understand one's value and one's worth? Yeah, so just, uh, you know, again, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here. And looking out at the audience at so many beautiful women, it's just really amazing. So I, I appreciate being here. You know, I think knowing your worth is, first of all, knowing you're worth it. And it really is about knowing who you are. Um, you know, over time, I, I've been at Dow now for 25 years, and I, and I, you know, I think back, and there's some lessons I wish I would have known in the beginning. Uh, yeah, I had the pleasure of going to Howard University, and so I think that was really the foundation. Ain't you in the house? You know. Um, it was really the foundation of me understanding, um, as Kamala Harris said, the, the legacy of the context in which I live. Uh, and I remember showing up at our company picnic uh, as, a, as a freshman intern with a t-shirt that said, naturally black, no artificial coloring. Now, like, who does that, right? Uh, but, but I did. Um, and so that was really the, the foundation for me understanding who I was. But then as I entered the corporate world, over time, to be transparent, I lost that. Started to try to fit in. Um, you know, watched what it took to be successful bought into the price of success that somebody else had set. And I started to lose my own self-worth. But then something happened along the way. Um, I was offered a job to report to the, to the CEO that I didn't want to take, because uh, I had been running one of the largest businesses in the company. And when he came to me and offered me that, that job, I didn't really know what I was worth. And it was really someone in my personal board of directors that said, you are aiming way too low. You are aiming way too low. Use your leverage. And so, so the key in understanding what you're worth is, first of all, the first time that you have to exercise that option, it shouldn't be the first time you go find it out. So taking the calls from the headhunters, taking the calls from the headhunters to really understand what your worth is externally, so that you can negotiate that internally. The value also of that, those board of directors is that they can articulate, help you articulate what your value is as well, because research will tell you that women generally don't negotiate when men do. And there really are two reasons for that. First of all, um, we are programmed to put other people's needs in front of our own. 
front of our own. That's the first thing. And the second thing is that we generally believe we are going to be recognized for our hard work and dedication. It's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. So ha having that, board of, that external board of directors that will give you the confidence, that will help you understand what you're worth, and that will really push you to do it. It was someone outside of the company that said, this is what you need to ask for. This is what I know you are worth because all of the things that you have done, and really being able to clearly articulate what you've done in the context of impact. If you look at your resume, and we talked about this this morning, if you look at your resume, if it's a litany of things you've done versus the things that have really added bottom line impact, there's a disconnect. You really have to be able to articulate not only here's what I've done, but this is why it has mattered. And the reality is when someone comes and asks you to do a job, they, they already know what you're, what you're able to do. And so it is the absolute best time to really negotiate for what you're really worth. So again, headhunters, great way. There are a lot of electronic tools out there that can help you understand the value of jobs. And I will tell you, had I not taken the job that I really didn't want to take, then there would be no way that I would be the first African-American female officer in our company. That was the gateway. That, that was the gateway uh, for me being, being in this job. And just in closing, I will tell you that the blessing of being the chief HR officer is now you have the window into what compensation really is. Compensation, and I don't want to jump ahead, but I think it's important for us to talk about in this conversation what is the, con what is the concept of total compensation. Um, too many times I see my sisters negotiating what I call to the right of the decimal point versus to the left. And I want to have the real talk in this conversation about going to the left of that decimal point. Because we aim too low. And that was a lesson that I learned, like I said, when I took a job I really didn't want to take. Uh, and and I, I don't want you all to be in that position and waiting 20, 25 years like I did before we start to negotiate to the left. Because I know without a shadow of a doubt that I left money on the table. I left money on the table. So, so we can get to that all right. positioning to the <laughs> left of that decimal. <laughs> Absolutely. Deirdre. So I, I'd like to take a different little spin on there. And so it's one thing for you to know what you're worth, but it's another thing when you're getting ready to negotiate for that person to know what you're worth. And you have to, to do that. And so in this particular role, um, I'm in sales. And so there was a position that had become available. They were creating a position. And so they had told me about it. And I decided that that was my job. And when I talked to the gentleman about it, he told me that in 60 days, they would have um, better, more information on it. And so I decided at that point, well, he does not seem to realize that this is my job. So let me help him with this. So I left, literally left my office, went to buy some popcorn. I put it in a basket. I got some cellophane paper, created a nice little gift bag, and I got a note card. And I wrote a note on there. And I said to him, Richard, I'm going to keep popping up until I become a part of your team. And I had that left in his office that same day. And so he called me, and he said, oh, that was clever. <laughs> because in sales, you know, we have to be memorable, and we have to create wow experiences. He says, I'm going to call you in 60 days. So I marked my calendar, and on that 60th day, he called me first. And I thought, oh. And so he wanted to let me know that they were still progressing, and you know, just be patient. And I said, OK, I will. And so I pulled out this ribbon. I had had this ribbon printed up. It says, Deidre Jr., Deidre Jr., Deidre Jr. And I wrote him a note. And I said, Richard, I want you to take this ribbon and wrap it around your phone as a reminder to call me when that position becomes available. And Where'd you get the ribbon? Because we all need to go get the ribbon. <laughs> we so you know, you know for what, as I, at one point in my life, I, I did wedding coordinating. And so there was a lady that, you know, when you're doing weddings, they yes. have those wedding, you go wherever they have weddings and they have that ribbon, you can get your name, they print that ribbon up, they put your name on there. I had, I had, I was being very proactive in letting him know. I had a whole litany of things lined up, but it didn't have to, it didn't go any further than that. And so I say that to say that when the position finally came available, there was no one else that they interviewed for that job. That was my job. And so when you talk about knowing your worth, when you hear people call you crazy, have you seen Serena's new video? Yes. Her new? Yes, uh -huh. it's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, show them what crazy is. 
You, mean, you have to let them, sh you have to show them your worth as well. Because when you show them your worth, that negotiation strategy um, becomes a lot easier. You know, one of the things that, that you talked about this morning, and, and going back to, to, or we talked about this morning, going back to knowing your worth, um, is the discomfort in talking about money. So, so a lot of times, you know, we talk about worth, yeah, you know, I'm good at this, I'm good at that, but no, let's get down to, like, really, the money. Um, and, and we generally are uncomfortable talking in the context of dollars and cents. But again, I can't tell you how many men come into my office and they, they've got it down to a science. Mm -hmm. They've got it down, they've got it down. They know the dollar figure, they've done the research, and these are people that, quite frankly, aren't capable even. Right? <laughs> And they will ask for the moon and the stars and, you know, the, the whole thing with no problem, no problem being told no. Um, and we're sitting back thinking, well, you know, I just, you know, I don't, you know, I don't want to um, offend anyone. I mean, these, these are things that, that we say. I don't want to offend anyone or I don't want to appear to not be loyal or, or not, not committed. Um, and we know that uh, we have not because we? Absolutely. And what's the worst case scenario? Right. Absolutely. Um, but we also know the consequences of not asking. I mean, you all know the statistics, right? We, we know that, uh, you know, less than 5% of the CEOs uh, in the, um, the, the Fortune 500 are women. We know that um, there used to be a few of us that were women of color. I mean, that's fewer and fewer. We know that 6% of the C-suite executives are African American. So, so those are the consequences. And understand that when you are negotiating, you're not just negotiating on your own behalf. Th this is really about genera uh, generating generational wealth. Mm -hmm. so, so if you have to trick your mind and know that you're not negotiating for yourself, but for your generations, for your children, for your grandchildren, for the charities, the things that you care about, for those women that are coming behind you, so that perhaps they don't have to negotiate as hard. That is why we must do this. And I know that perhaps many of us were raised the same way, it's not about the money, you don't want to advocate on your behalf, you know, be humble, those sort you, We have got to advocate on our own behalf. We have got to go in and ask for it. We have got to negotiate. When we get into a job, nine times out of 10, we are overqualified. So we have to discern between what we want and what we deserve. So and let's, to, so, oh, so, so let's, okay. let's, let's yeah. stay with that for a minute. So here's a question for all of you. How many of you were raised that you need to work twice as hard? Yeah. And as long as you work twice as hard, yeah. they will come and find you. Yeah. How many of us? So one of the things, and it's hard to push up against socialization. Mm -hmm. Now, here's, so here's a perfect example, because yeah. I really want us to unpack this a yes. little bit about the ask yeah. and why is it so uncomfortable for us to yeah. ask. You know, I've been out in the business. I would define myself as successful. I think I'm doing okay. I think I can negotiate. I think I can go in and ask for what I want. So I was sitting up here last year and I, it was bonus time. And you all know what happens when bonus comes. Everybody's excited and they're waiting to get the number. Well, I got my number and I was not happy. And so I went home and I was sitting there and I said, now how am I gonna manage this? And I said, now they know my value. They know what I deserve. They know what I should have. So I called up my significant other, significant other who was a, who, and he's retired now, was senior client partner of his firm. He sat on the executive committee. He sat on the compensation committee. And I called him up and I said, Lamont, let me tell you what they did. <laughs> you know what? I thought I was supposed to get this and blah, 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 blah. And I, he let me go on. And when I finished, you know what he said? He said, get over it. And I said, well, aren't you loving? <laughs> and he said, Audra, that's the problem with women. Men understand that it is always, always about negotiation. Mm -hmm. There is nothing that you cannot go in and negotiate. And we understand that and we do it all the time. Yeah. And going back to what you just said, Karen, mm -hmm. he talked about the fact, he said, now I'm sitting on the compensation committee and all of a sudden we put out bonuses for the year. Somebody knocks on my door, man comes in and he said, you need to sharpen the pencil. And Lamont said, he looked at him, he says, talk to me. He said, look, 
I hit my numbers, I did this, I did this, I did this, and oh, by the way, I got kids to educate. You need to sharpen the pencil and make sure you can take care of this. It went out the door. Lamont said he sat back, he thought about the man's contribution, he thought about what he had done, and he got an increase. How many times do we wait because of our socialization? Just work hard and they're gonna find you. Just keep working twice as hard and they're gonna find you. At some point when they don't find you, you get tired and worn down so you're not working twice as hard. Then they're, gonna, they're not gonna ever find you mm -hmm. <laughs> because yeah. there are other people out there who are working it. So I really want us to be able to, to sort of think about this because when I found myself getting off the phone after that conversation with him, I said, he's right. So you all know what I did, but we'll, I'll save that for later on. We'll come, <laughs> we'll, we'll come back to it. And, but, and I really, also, but, what, but I want to talk about this fact of why is it so hard for women to ask? Well, for what they the want? one thing that we were talking about is, you know, so earlier today you've heard about your network is, is your net worth. Mm -hmm. There's some real value to that. And oftentimes, in just a discussion that I had with some of my girlfriends in anticipation of sitting on this panel, we talked about what we don't know. And when you don't know something, it makes you uncomfortable. And that network that you have, you should be able to have resources that you can tap and ask those questions. We're so quick to call our girlfriends and ask, girl, does this look good on me today? Girl, can you help me cook this? But we are not asking our girlfriends that are in these positions to, to talk about, you know, what should I be looking for? You know, what does that number, what's reasonable and what's unreasonable? And we just, we just, we're not having those conversations. The other thing we're not talking about, because we have colleagues that we work with, we're not sharing information on, okay, here's, you know, something that you should be looking towards, looking to get, because this is what the, we know what the company's offering. Because we just don't, it's just an uncomfortable conversation. And someone, and you know, when you're working for the same company, you don't want to share that, oh, I have this, and then you get this resentment, you get the side eye from your girlfriend, because they do not have it. Yeah. But that's not what sh we should be doing. You should be asking, how did you get that? How did you even know that existed? We have to leverage our relationships and tap our resources in order to be able to go down that uncomfortable road. And so this, is this gets back to this whole point of total compensation. Um, I do think that, that well, no, I, I know that most people only look at the base salary. And, and we will be happy with a 5 or 7% 10% increase and focused on that. But when you really start to look at total compensation, there, there are four components. You have the base salary, you have equity, and I want to get back to equity. You have the bonus, which by the way, sometimes can be just as much as your annual salary. And then you have perks. It could be cars, it could be you know, access to a plane, um, you know, it could be a number of different things. Your child's education. Your child's education. It, child's education, it could be a number of different things. And most people only negotiate on the base salary, which I would contend is, again, to the right of the decimal point. But you've got to get educated around you know, what's possible. I mean, if you think about equity and long-term incentives in terms of stock, et cetera, that's when you start to really build wealth. When you think about the percentage of a base pay in terms of your bonus, which can be negotiated, that's when you're really talking about generating wealth. And perks, I mean, the list can be endless. Um, and so really understanding those pieces, those individual components of compensation, and defining the boundaries within which you can negotiate uh, within a company, you know, what do they normally do? And, and we, when we get into position, we have to be willing to appropriately share that information. You know, what, what is possible? Uh, you know, what is appropriate? But the biggest hurdle is actually just going in and doing it. Mm -hmm. So I've also seen people that will do all the research, will get coached up, and I, I always uh, suggest that people practice, and then they get cold feet. They will revert back to that old behavior. The last thing I'll say is that it, it's not only about um, negotiating uh, when you think you, you didn't get what you deserve. But what I've also seen, perhaps more than that, is when people get promoted, they're just happy with what they get. And they, and they never take a step back and say, thank you, let me think about it. Go socialize that total compensation package with your personal board of directors, and then circle back. They're just happy to get the job because they never thought they would get it. You know, and I, and I you know, me too. 
you know, first, only, great, they never put, you know, and then wait a minute, hold up, is the dollar figure right? And really going back and, and having that conversation. Mm -hmm. And then going back to where we're, we get to that point, we've been coached, we have all the information, we get cold feet. Yeah. You know, that's, you got to take us, that means you do not feel that you don't deserve it. And we as women so often are so humble about not owning our greatness. But when you own your greatness, we have to practice owning our greatness. We have to practice what they say, tooting our horn. Yeah. Because when you own your greatness, you will, you will be able to march in there with all that information and you know, professionally demand these things. But you have to own it. You have to, to know your self-worth. Can, can we circle back to that? Um, because I, you know, I think, you know, the, the, and this painful, but the, the root of that, when you really get to the fundamentals of the imposter syndrome, um, you know, when I think about the things that people say to me, say about me, most of them don't hurt me. But the ones that do, when I'm really honest with myself, because there's, there's a little bit of that that maybe I believe. Because if you say something, and you know, I'm thinking, you're not talking, you can't be talking about me. <laughs> um, but it's the ones that cause me to pause, that, that when I'm really honest with myself, maybe I believe it. When you get into those jobs um, and you say, great, awesome, how did I get here? Those moments when you start to say, do I really deserve to be here? Am I good enough? Do I know enough? We have to push through that. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you, one of the best things that, that happened to me, and, and, and she's here and I won't embarrass her, is when, when I did get appointed to, to being the, the uh, first uh, inclusion officer for the company, um, a group of ladies invited me to dinner. And I thought we were just going to dinner. And they happened to be all women of color. And when we got there, they said, we just want you to know that we got your back. We got your back. And they gave me a gift, and it had all these hands on it, and it said, covered. Mm -hmm. And so we're praying for you every time. When I got the, the uh, officer job to be the, the chief human resources officer, same thing. We got your back. One of them just sent me a card last week to say, I'm praying for you. So when, you, when that imposter syndrome, which by the way is a lie, and we know the root of it is fear, right. starts to creep in, that's when you got to go back to your, your personal board of directors and say, hey, this is how I'm feeling today. I'm not sure. And they're like, uh oh, <laughs> no, we're not going there because we got your back. So don't underestimate the importance of that and really having this honest self-assessment with where is that coming from? What is the root of that? And, and pushing past that. And, and it also goes back to the whole notion of really understanding my value yeah. and my worth and what I deserve. And when it happens, it's not about, because see, sometimes people think you should be grateful. Yeah. And I'm not <laughs> saying grateful is not a thing, but yeah. I mean, but I'm talking about when you have worked hard and you have earned it, when you've worked the political process, you've understand, you understood how to navigate it, you put all that through there and it doesn't happen the way you want, you gotta be able to say, you know what, wait a minute. Because see, once I understand my value, based on what you owe, and I understand my worth, then I got the agility now to manage what's in front yeah. of me. So if it's working my way, then I leverage it. If it's not working my way, I said I got to come back and do some things differently. Again, just another quick add, I was having a different kind of conversation about something that I felt that I should, should have in the firm. And I was clear about it. And the woman was trying to convince me that I was a little fuzzy. And I looked at her and I said, do you think I'm new? <laughs> <laughs> I've been around. Yeah. I understand my value. See, yeah. when you understand it, you problem solve differently. When things come your way, you look at them differently because you know where you want to get when you're talking about that end point. But if you're fuzzy, you're uncomfortable, you're not clear, then that's when all this other stuff can come in and wraps itself around you. And even if you know what you do, even if when you've done the, the research, even when you know the number you should ask for, you don't come in in a congruent way and put it on the table yeah. and it undermines your credibility and it undermines your influence and it diminishes you and it diminishes the outcome. So what we're saying here, representing here is, to me, if, if you all walk out of this room and, you, and there's nothing, I mean, just to be real clear and steely around, I have value, I am important, 
and I make a contribution to my business. And I want it to be a win-win. And if I'm doing all of this for my company and the company's winning, then I need to win too. And so you know winning looks like? It looks like the role and looks like a lot of things, but in terms of compensation, I mean, do any of you go to work just to be working? Mm -mm. No, <laughs> no ma'am. And many of you are going to work no, to move not. beyond just making it. You are going to build something. Because see, when you think about what is being shared by our panelists here, we're not talking about negotiating to get that, that increase. We're talking about being able to negotiate to build wealth to be able to understand how you live, how you pass it down, and how you continue to pass it down. It gets much bigger. You keep saying, which side of the decimal? We have gotta get to the left. And it gets bigger. So what we wanna encourage you all to do is to think about it in terms of your value in a big way. Because when this is centered, all the problem solving, I'm telling you, all the problem solving just starts working in your favor. And the next thing you know, you sit back and you listen to them and you say, Wait a minute, they don't know what they're getting ready to get, you know, because I'm getting ready to work this a little bit. And then you begin to put the things in place. Because sometimes when you talked about the, the, the perks mm -hmm. and the benefits, yes. it is amazing what people will negotiate for. There was this person out here, he said, look, I need more money and I want it tax protected. Now, how many of you have asked for an increase and said you want it tax, <laughs> you want it, you want it tax? Tax protected. That means you bump it up another 30% so that my, so I don't have to manage the taxes. See, it's those little yeah. things like that that we don't understand is out there. But if we don't share it with each other, how are we supposed to know? And, and someone said the other day, she said, oh, my child went to private school through, through the whole thing, and I didn't pay a dime. I said, and how did that happen? She said, it's called negotiation. So it's not just the fact that you move to a place of comfort around negotiation, but it's also around the fact, do you know what to negotiate mm -hmm. right. yes. for? Yes, absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about women and money, our comfort with money. How many of you are comfortable with money? <laughs> Spending Notice. it or? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> All the hands. Fewer, most hands stay down. Mm -hmm. So again, we're, we're push, we want to push against your socialization this afternoon. Our socialization about what we think we should have. But this whole notion around women and money, I was sharing mm -hmm. with Karen and Deirdre, I said I had a chance to go to a um, event. Now how I got invited there, I don't know. It was at Harvard University and they were having a weekend event and it was for women and philanthropy. And I walked into the room, and I, oh, now I remember, I was with one of my dear friends, walked into the room, we were the only two black people in the room. And I looked at these women, there were probably about 60 in the room, and they all had inherited wealth. I mean, they had, you know, have you ever heard the expression, stupid money? <laughs> they had a ton of it. And they were so angry. They were angry at their fathers for how they treated their brothers compared to how they treated them. They were angry about the fact that they, they could, that, that their family members were trying to encroach on their, um, the ability of them to be able to lead and manage the wealth. But there was a whole, there was a lot of discomfort about it. So here's my question to the two of you. When you think about how you are working to build wealth, mm -hmm. or how did you get comfortable with understanding how to move that decimal, how to move it to the other side. So, I, you know, for me, it was, uh, I always, I mean, I've been working since I was 13. This is being recorded, so maybe I shouldn't say this, but even before it was legal for me to work because my, my father died of a heart attack when I was 12, uh, and so I had to go to work. Um, and so I grew up knowing um, how I didn't want to live. Uh, um, I grew up knowing, um, you know, that I didn't want to live paycheck to paycheck, and I, you know, if I ever get grown, you know, whoever should be. How many people said that? If I ever get grown, uh, you know, this is what I'm not going to do. But I, but I also, it, for me, it's a, it's a drive because there were things I also wanted to go back and do for my mother, uh, things that uh, she wasn't able to do working two, two or three jobs. So, so understanding the money was always a priority, but it wasn't just for the currency. It was because of the why. 
And so I've had a financial advisor my entire career when, when I was making very little money. Um, getting out of debt has always been a priority because that equals freedom. Getting out of debt equals freedom. Um, and so then as I began to build well, uh, it was really more imperative for me to, to ensure that I had financial advisors, that, but I, that I understood for myself. So uh, what happens a lot of times is, is we will go get a financial advisor, but then you know, delegate that responsibility to, to them. We have to educate ourselves um, on our own financials, on what is stock, what's a you know, mutual fund, what are bonds, what are the rates, uh, where should you put your money, um, et cetera, so that we know what we know. And even my granddaughters are involved because I want them to understand the value of money, the options that it gives you, but also how to invest. And so it starts, it, it, people, people tend, particularly us, think, well, if we don't have a lot of money, then that doesn't pertain to me. That's when it absolutely pertains to us, when we don't. And so we, before you can get comfortable negotiating, we have to be comfortable with the concept of money and having the discussion and not delegating that responsibility to someone else. So that's, I think, that's, I think, really critical. Okay. All right. And for me, it's very simple. You have to be comfortable with not having money first so that when you get it, then you maximize it. And so it's, it, you, I just, I, I, I'm not saying that I'm rich or anything, nowhere near it, but I, you just can't let money rule you. I, I, there's people who, you know, they can't pay this bill, they can't pay that bill, or they don't have enough to go buy the Gucci and, and the Prada. And you just cannot allow money to rule you. Um, there's other things other than, than the money. You know, for me with work, it's about, can I leave at 3 o'clock to go to my son's basketball game? Is my mortgage going to be paid? You know, it's the simple things. And so when you get comfortable with not having it and, and, and not letting it control you, that helps you get more comfortable with the money when you don't have it and don't let it control you. Okay. Now let's, let's move, let's sort of shift a little bit around the negotiation process because I think one of the things that's critical is to be clear about your, your non-negotiables yes. and your, your negotiables. Yes. How did you all figure out what you could flex and compromise on and what you were going to take a hard stand on? So I want to move outside of the, the money for a second because for me, um, you know, my priorities have changed throughout my life. And, and um, the last job that I got, because uh, my husband and I have moved several times, uh, you know, mostly for my career. And I told him that we have this agreement that he can always throw the, the flag on the field at any point in time. Um, and the first time I did that was when I got the, my last job offer. And it was at a time where we had just lost my father-in-law, uh, my, my husband's an only child, uh, my mother-in-law at the time was 85. And we just weren't leaving her. We just flat out weren't leaving her. So that, that was a walk away position for me and that negotiation. So I, all, I already knew going in these two or three things that were a must for me. And I was ready to own the consequences of those choices um, and say, you know, I'm not moving. I've moved 12 times for the company. Uh, this is important to me. So if I can do that job from here, awesome. If I can't, then it's for someone else. And so I think it's important, and they change, right? Our, our priorities change depending on where we are in our lives. But, but you know what's most important to you when you're willing to walk away. When you're willing to walk away, that's when you know. Um, and clearly understanding those, and I would say even writing them down um, is even more critical. Just, just another quick one. Uh, I mentioned my, my granddaughters, and by the way, I lose every negotiation with them. So <laughs> it just, it, it, they're eight and 11, and the eight year old, she's just got me. Um, you know, I'm not at, obviously, at every event I've been traveling my entire career, but, but Mackenzie was, was uh, graduating from kindergarten. No, no, she told me it was a promotion, it wasn't a graduation. <laughs> she was getting promoted. Um, and so for me, that, that was a non negotiable. I, I, you know, I really needed to be there. There are events that I put on my calendar that I've just got to do. And so she's so used to me not being there. She said, Nana, are you coming to my promotion? I said, yes, Mackenzie, I'm going to be there. So she came back, Nana, are you going to be at my promotion? And I said, yes, Mackenzie, I'm going to be there. So she came back a third time, and she's short. So I get down whenever she's in trouble. Usually I have to get eye, eyesight with her. Yes, Mackenzie, Nana's going to be there. 
And so the morning of, something blew up, not literally, I work at a chemical company, not literally. <laughs> something blew up at work. And so I'm driving to, to her, her private school in Third Ward in Houston, and I finally get there. My daughter's there, her dad's there, my husband's there. She's about to walk across the stage, and she gets halfway across. And before she can go all the way, she looks out and she sees my husband, she sees her mama, she sees her daddy, and she wouldn't go the rest of the way until she saw me. And I'm in the back. And then she goes, for me, that's a non-negotiable. That, that's a, that's a, am I at every birthday party? No. Am I at every school? No. So, so really being clear about what those are, because you don't get them back, y'all. And whatever, and it's personal. For some people, being at every basketball game, that, you know, you, you have to own it. But going into those negotiations and understanding, because it, it's not all about the money. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's about these other personal, flexible, other things that are just, you've got to have. So it also feels like when you're in negotiations, you get clear about under what, under what assumption will I say yes? Yes. And under, under what assumptions would I say no? Yes. Because sometimes when I'm in a position and I'm coaching and I'm working with someone and they say, there's no way in the world I'll take this job. And I said, before you say no, are there any assumptions that would cause you to say, I will take it? So you at least give your, so instead of going to a yes, no, it, what are those, those assumptions the, that I, The boundaries within right. which you will. That's right, yes. that's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, well I see we just got a, uh, I got a sign in the back the saying, Audra, it's time for question and answers. So please, we got mics here, and we have about 10 minutes to be able to open the floor. What questions do you all have for us? Please. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Laura Rome, and I'm a business owner. Wow. And I want to make sure that I'm doing the right thing and knowing my uh, worth because I want to work with some corporate, um, some corporate, uh, bi some businesses, um, in offering a dear, a good service for them for their retirees or people leaving, um, whether they're getting laid off or fired, and making sure they have their uh, benefits in place or helping them get the benefits as mm -hmm. they transition. Um, so. I don't know really how to price it. I don't know how to uh, present it. I'm, I'm, of course, you know, you have, I have this baby I have to birth. <laughs> and I really could use some um, guidance, Karen and Deirdre, <laughs> on how to actually um, put it together and package it. Um, so is your business a unique business? Is there a competitor of, uh, is there another organization that does what you do? No. Is there an organization that does something similar to what you do? Not that I know of. Okay. I'm special. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, I think they may do something similar. Um, as in, but I, I work a lot because I've been in benefits and brokering a long time, so I kind of bring um, a very good perspective on retirees, on um, people and their benefits and leaving. And to, this is actually goes to their legacy because when you mess that kind of things up, those type of things up, and you don't have it together, you wind up paying more for everything. Well, so it's. I'm sorry. No, I just want to, I just, because I, yes. One of the things we would like for you to give consideration to is that you have a unique business. Yes. And there is someone who can give you support and advice. And it's probably someone who's in your circle that you can't see right now. And if we just sit down, and please feel free to come up to us afterwards, because we want to make sure we can get through as many questions as we can. <laughs> but we Thank also want to make sure you're served. Okay. If we sit there and have a conversation, there are people, because many times we can't see what's right in front of us, and there are people that yes. can give you what you need to help you move forward. But please, when we finish, please feel free to come on up and we'll Thank be able you. to. Absolutely. Let's go over here, your question. Hi. 
everyone. Um, my name is Sinesia Farrell. Um, I'm from Chicago area. Um, I work at Spark Foundry under the publicist umbrella. And I just had a quick question about the salary conversation. So I strongly believe that, you know, across the board, having salary conversations and letting other people kind of know your number is taboo, you know, but it's something that shouldn't be. Um, so I proudly have those conversations with everyone. However, I had a situation where I had a white woman counterpart, my girlfriend, love her to death, but she's very weird about having those conversations. So I basically kind of didn't trust her enough to tell her my number even though I wanted to. So do you think that that was cautious of me or do you think that it should be something that I should have just let go across the board, like speaking to her about something like that even though I didn't trust her to have that conversation with anyone else or maybe disclosing anything that maybe I didn't want disclosed with her superiors or anything yeah. like that. So, so I think, I mean, listen, the people that make the most money in the companies, it's public information. Mm -hmm. So if, if you didn't know that. You know, so what's always my, you know, mind boggling to me is that, that people at different levels of the company are, are very weird about sharing their salaries when again, the people that make the most money in the company, you could just go look it up. And, and, and you, know, you know how much, you know how their bonuses are, how much they make, et cetera. That's personal. And most of the time, people don't want to share because they're afraid of the comparison about what if somebody else is making more than me or what if somebody else is, is making less than me. In your circle of trust, mm -hmm. that information can be quite powerful because that's where you find out perhaps where, where you should be negotiating or perhaps where you have a deficiency and there's a valid reason that you are making less. But it's a, it's a very personal thing about you, know, you sharing or not, or not sharing. But again, well, I'll just repeat, the people that make the most money in companies, it's public information. But I also but think she said, please go ahead. She, I also said was making thing. significantly more than her, and mm -hmm. I just felt weird. Now mind you, I've told other people, Yeah. but for her, I just wasn't sure how she would negotiate or have that conversation with other people or her superiors, so. So yeah. which, what you said was you did not trust. There you go. I did not trust. You have to go on that discerning feeling. And that's, good, huh? mm -hmm. okay. I agree, absolutely. Thank so you. no, you were fine. You have to, you have to have your own discern, discernment. Please, Hi. I'm coming Hi. over here. I'm, come over. I'm Cicely Washington, and um, this is a topic that I've been trying to figure out for a while. Um, and I've found, I've taken advice from my male counterparts, and I've tried to follow their equation because they do have it down to a T. Backfired horribly to the point I was like, actually let go. Because how dare I come in and ask, right? So my question to you is, what ways have women communicated it successfully? Because I feel as though I can't communicate it like my male counterparts do and have the same success. So I, you know, I think relationships are really key in negotiating and, and understanding the culture of the company and, and how do you do it. Because there, there's a difference between negotiating and demanding. Um, and it's often in how it's articulated. I, I would also say, I mean, because people, people negotiate with me all the time. Um, you know, I also think that if, and again, I don't know your personal situation, so, so I want to be a bit careful, but I also think that if there's a place that is um, not open to negotiation at all, then perhaps having a different location is not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. uh, because I will tell you that people do it all the time. Um, now, going back three or four times, I don't know. I mean, sometimes the answer is the answer, um, and you have to understand that, and then you have to determine what are, you, what are you going to do in that situation. But for me, the most effective negotiations are, are those that are factual, so it's not an emotional conversation. It's very factual. You have your information. You have a strategy. You've practiced, and you understand your non-negotiables. And you go in, you negotiate, you get the answer. You might, you might go back a second time depending. But the third and fourth, sometimes you already have the answer. And, and every culture is different. And the, you know, there are some cultures, they don't, nobody negotiates, which quite frankly in many cases is not true. Uh, because there are a number of different ways that you can, can have that conversation. But, so you but don't I, find there's a difference in style between the women that are successful at it and the men? Well, I what I would say is that men do it, my experience, men do it more than women do it, period. Mm -hmm. 
So very, very few, in my experience, very few women do it at all. Um, from a style perspective, I don't know. I, I do think that when, when certain people do it, people are surprised that that person is negotiating it, negotiating it at all. But I want to go back to a comment that she made before. It's not about being grateful. It's about having the conversation about what you think you deserve. We have to own the consequences of having the conversation, and we have to be ready for the answer. And then you have to decide how you're going to react to that. Again, I don't know the personal situation where you were let go because of negotiating, so I can't comment on that specifically because I haven't experienced that. But one thing, again, I just want to reiterate, it's important to do it. It is so important to just do it. And I think sometimes, I know we're getting the sign, I think sometimes we have in our minds what a negotiation is. We think it's a contentious conversation, or it's an argument, or it's back and forth. It doesn't have to be. No. It absolutely doesn't have to be. And here's another thing, too. When it comes to the art of negotiation, it's not about being righteous. It's not about, I am right, and this is what I deserve. I understand what I deserve, and I begin to look for strategy and pragmatism about how I'm going to get it. So I am very thoughtful. Sometimes I might have a soft entry. You know what? I'm just interested in understanding the salary ranges for this world. <laughs> or I might have to have a very hard one. I noticed that over the last X number, this has not happened. I need to understand why. But you're always going in with having range around how you will manage through it as opposed to being a one-note song and always coming in the same way. Because if you get dogmatic and you get righteous, you're going to lose. And wouldn't you say the most effective ones are sometimes they don't even know that's what you're doing? Because you're playing chess and not checkers. Absolutely. Right. And so sometimes... You, wait a minute, hold on, hold yes. on. Did you all hear that? She said you're playing what? Chess. 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 And not chess. checkers. Okay, I just wanted to make and sure. And so it can be a combination of a number of different conversations, you know, over time versus... I have a, a meeting notice on my calendar for Friday at 2 o'clock. I'm negotiating. And the one thing I will add, if you have a good leader and you have asked for this increase and they have said no, it's very important for you to understand the why. And a good leader will sit down and walk you through it. Because why and what do you need to do in order to progress? Okay. I think we got time for a couple of more. Let's go on this side. Hi, my name is Nkem Okafor. I'm from Dallas, and Dallas, Texas. And my question is, can you ever over-negotiate? So just say if it's an offer and you have your list of things that you would like and you know what the market serves and um, they have what they would like, is there a point where you as the potential candidate, you can actually over-negotiate that offer? I would say that it goes back to knowing what you will um, agree to and what you will not agree to. I mean, if you've, if you've received the things that you've, that you've asked for, then of course, but if you, I mean, if you're over-negotiating when you feel like, I mean, if you're, if you, if you're having to over-negotiate, then perhaps that deal is not what you want. Perhaps what they're saying to you is they can't give you what you want, if that's the feeling that you're getting. Thank you. Hi, my name is Yasmin Grant, and I'm from PepsiCo. I have a quick two-part question. My first question is, how do you maintain leverage when you're negotiating for a promotion when you have to accept the role before you're presented with the financial offer? And what's the, um, the one most important thing you negotiated for once you got to the C-suite? Yeah, so I'll, I'll answer this, the second part first because it's easier. Uh, um, the thing that I negotiated at the C-suite was flexibility um, and then some executive perks. So th those two things, uh, again, because the flexibility was just where I was in my, my personal life that, that I needed to do that. Oh, and, and actually one of the perks that I negotiated for was, you know, I didn't, I thought that people that had executive coaches were people that were in trouble. So that's why I grew up thinking like, oh, that person, that they don't like him, they're trying to fix him. <laughs> um, and what I didn't know that, boy, people use executive coaches to get some of their work done. So when I got my last job, I was like, I'm just gonna go in and ask for one. You know, so that was part of the negotiation. And I will tell you that, um, uh, I know we're out of time, but I sent my executive coach, who does this, an email, a long email, in case she wanted to forward it to our CEO, that said, if this is about me being better, I'm in. If it's about changing me, I want no part in it. 
I want no part in it. Because I didn't want to have to give up who I was to be successful in the C-suite. So that's another thing that I, that I negotiated for. Because again, not having the information, I didn't understand that. That's how some people get their work done, is through, through these executive coaches. Um, the first part of your question, I, I find it interesting that people, that's why we were kind of smiling at each other, uh, that, that people would require people to accept a job without understanding the compensation. Yeah. And so this gets back to, and again, I don't know about anybody's company, but this gets back to the courage to say, let me think about it, and can you tell me what the compensation is? Because it's important to align the compensation with the responsibilities and the things that they are asking you to do. So I can't, I can't really answer if in a company they're saying, you, you have to say yes before you get the compensation, but, but I find that to be a bit of, not a bit, a big disconnect mm -hmm. between how, I don't have all the information to no be able to say yes or no. Mm -hmm. There needs and, to be yeah. transparency. And you also sometimes can just tie it to the whole notion of, is this the way you usually operate? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Mm. I just, I just, and I'm, and I'm not judging. I'm coming from a place of curiosity. Do you tend to give people jobs first and then they get compensated six months later? I just want to know your mode of operating. <laughs> so what you do is you bring it up and you're asking from a place. And it's a fair question. It, it, it really is. It is a very fair question. And see, again, that goes back to our value and our worth. I'm clear about where I want, what I want. I'm going to go in to have a conversation. I'm going to get information that's going to inform me. And then I'm going to give it some thought. And you know what? I'll get right back to you. It's not always, but you've got to make sure it's a win. We've just received the signal that's letting us know we have to wrap. For those of you that are still standing, we're here. Please feel free to come up and we will answer your questions. We just want to thank you all. We hope this has been helpful. And thank you so much for joining us.